understand that when it says do something, we say we do it. You understand? That's the way we take our proclamations. As the elect, elect of God, God holy and, and beloved, we put on tender, tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave us, so we also must do. But above all these things, we put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and we let the peace of God rule in our hearts, to which also we were called in one body, and we, we, let, are, and we are thankful. And we are thankful. Good, thank you. We let the, the word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And whatever we do, in word or deed, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Now, in a certain sense, what I want to say in this closing message is a follow-on from what I was talking about last night. And I was shocked to discover that I'd preached for two hours. I'm not exactly apologizing because I couldn't have completed what I had to say in less. But last night I spoke about the rise of the Antichrist and I sought to give you an overall biblical picture what kind of a person he will be and how he will operate and what he will do. I also told you that his title, one of his three titles in the Bible, is the wild beast. Tonight I want to speak in that context about another kind of being who is the exact opposite the Lamb. And if you will look at the book of Revelation in this light, I think you will see that it represents a war between the Lamb of God and the wild beast. It's interesting that the Lamb is mentioned 28 times in the book of Revelation. And the wild beast is mentioned 35 times in the same book. Now in English, the exact parallel is not clear. But in the Greek of the New Testament, there's a very clear balance between these two titles. Because the Greek word for the lamb is arnion, and the Greek word for the wild beast is therion. So they're exactly similar in form. There's a kind of balance in the book of Revelation, in the revelation of the lamb and the revelation of the wild beast. Now, thinking over what I said last night, I thought I'll try and think of a list of epithets that describe the wild beast. And I came up with 10, which I will read out to you. Cunning, deceitful, arrogant, boastful, vicious, cruel, treacherous, murderous, despotic, despotic and dominating. I think I'll read the list again because I think we need to know what kind of a person we're involved with. Cunning, deceitful, arrogant, boastful, vicious, cruel, treacherous, murderous, despotic, and dominating. And I think it's a little interesting that Yenka has come out with his book 
if I can remember the three titles, they are, do, no, first of all, is it domination? Yes, that's domination, intimidation, and control. Is that right? All right, let's get it right. Manipulation, domination, and control. You know what spirit that is? It's the spirit of the wild beast. Now, he wasn't writing his book, I haven't read it, but he wasn't writing his book about the future. He's writing that book about situations and people that we confront in daily life. And furthermore, many of them are inside the church and not a few of them are in the ministry. I say this because I want you to understand that we are in the midst of a conflict between two spiritual forces the spirit of the wild beast and the spirit of the lamb. And my personal opinion, I believe the Lord has made this clear to me, is that now is the time when we are making our decisions. And if we allow ourselves to be controlled by the spirit of the wild beast now, when he is actually manifested, we will come under him. It will be too late then to say, no, I don't want that. I hope you can understand what I'm saying. If I'm correct, we today, by our attitudes and the way we live and the way we relate, are determining our destiny. Because the, the world is going to be confronted with just a simple choice between the lamb and the wild beast. And everybody who is not under the lamb will be under the wild beast. And if you're under the lamb, you'll manifest the spirit of the lamb now. And if you're manifesting the spirit of the wild beast now, when he appears, you'll be one of his victims. You cannot change then. That's why the way we live now in this end time is so critical. And that's why I believe it's so important we understand the issues. One thing I've learned about the devil, and I think David Pawson says the same thing, is what he hates most is to be exposed. And what I'm seeking to do in the light of scripture is to expose him. And I know he doesn't like me. However, I'll get on without his favor. In Revelation 17, verses 12 through 14, this war that I'm speaking about is actually described. Without, I can't go back into what I taught uh, last night about the ten horns, etc. You just have to start from that. Revelation 17, verse 12 and following. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So there is a clear statement of, the war, of the, the war. This war is really one main theme of the book of Revelation. There is a war between the beast and those who are associated with him and the lamb. Who is the lamb? Jesus, that's right. And you notice the kind of people that are with the lamb? Did you see that? Those who are with him have three descriptions. They're called, they're chosen, and they're faithful. You see, Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. A lot of people are invited, and they may accept the invitation, but they don't fulfill the requirements. 
so they're not chosen. This is true of missionary calling. Multitudes of people are called, but they're never chosen because they don't meet the conditions, they don't fulfill the requirements. But after being chosen, there's one more requirement, which is to be faithful. And so if we are to be in the, the army of the Lamb, we have to fulfill those three requirements, called, chosen, and faithful. And I'm probably, I've been a Christian probably longer than most of you here, we talk a lot, a lot about the problems of young Christians. I want to tell you they're nothing compared with the problem of old Christians. Don't imagine it gets easier. It doesn't. It gets more complicated and more demanding the further you go. The pressures increase. But you, your strength should increase to be able to meet the pressures. Now in John chapter 1, we have the lamb very beautifully introduced by the man sent to introduce him who was John the Baptist. And in John 1 verse 29 to 34 we have this divine introduction. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. It's interesting in that critical passage which introduces Jesus, there are two creatures of the animal world that are used to symbolize spiritual truth. There's a bird, the dove, and there's an animal, the lamb. And the scripture says the dove descended on the lamb and remained on him. You see, the Holy Spirit was looking for one person who would fulfill the qualification. He wasn't looking for a lion, he wasn't looking for a tiger, he wasn't looking for an elephant, he was looking for a lamb. And that is the only nature on which the Spirit of God will descend and remain on him. And you cannot receive the Holy Spirit as a believer unless there is in you the nature of Jesus through the rebirth. And he will descend on that nature. He'll not descend on you because of what you are in your own nature. But he'll descend on the new nature in you that comes through the new birth, the nature of Jesus. But the very important qualification concerning Jesus as the Messiah was that the Spirit would descend on him and remain on him. Now this is the critical test. It is relatively easy to receive the Holy Spirit today. It's preached and taught and testified to. And I have seen thousands of people receive the Holy Spirit. I've seen the dove come down upon them. But of those, I would say, relatively few had the dove remaining on them. Because he will only remain where the spirit of the Lamb prevails. And I'm not, I have to be careful what I say, but I could exemplify various men, ministries, and movements upon which 
The dove descended, but he did not remain. And he is not there today. And you and I need, need to ask ourselves. Sure, we were baptized in the Holy Spirit. In my case, it was 51 years ago. The question is not what happened 51 years ago. The question is, what is my relationship to the dove today? Has he remained on me through 51 years? Now, you don't have to answer that question for me. That's my question. But you have to answer it for yourself. People come to me and they say, Brother Prince, in 1982 I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. I say, fine, but we're living in 1992. What's happened in the intervening 10 years? Is he still remaining on you? And I have to say, it is tragic the number of instances in which the Holy Spirit descended but did not remain because the people involved did not cultivate and manifest the nature of the Lamb. Now, I have to be careful what I say because I don't want in any way to attack other ministries. But I suggest that when you are confronted with a ministry that makes claims on you, you should ask yourself, is the dove remaining on them? Are they manifesting the nature of the Lamb? I'll give you an example from good many years past, about 50 or more years ago, 60. Between the two world wars, God gave to Britain two of the most outstanding evangelists that this century has witnessed. They were brothers in the flesh, George Jeffries and Stephen Jeffries. And I know people who knew them, who were in their meetings, who've told me personally. I don't think there's been another evangelist in this century with a greater or more powerful ministry than George Jeffries. In those days, Pentecost was a kind of derided little sect. And few people were willing to pay the price to follow. But when George Jeffries preached he filled the Royal Albert Hall with 9,000 people without any effort. And as he walked down the aisles to the platform, as he came level with each row of seats, the power of God came on every person in those rows. George and Stephen were brothers. Both had powerful ministry but they quarreled. Not merely were they brothers in the spirit, but they were actually brothers in the flesh. Yet they quarreled, they fell down, they could not work together. George Jeffries was the founder of the Elim movement. But the people through whom I came to the Lord actually were present when they heard George Jeffries say, I'll crush Elim. Because he had broken away from his own movement. What is that? It's a tragedy that grieves the heart of God more than we can ever understand. One of the things about Pentecost and charismatic movement is we focus on power. I believe in power. Power is exciting. But there are things that are more important than power. Yes. Holiness is one and love is another. And we need to ask ourselves, is the dove remaining on me? Am I manifesting, cultivating the nature of the lamb? And I have to say the nature of the lamb is absolutely contrary to contemporary culture. I doubt whether there's ever been an age in which culture has been so totally opposite to the nature of the Lamb. I was asking myself 
how could I briefly depict from Scripture the nature of the Lamb? And I felt God directed me to the Sermon on the Mount, to Matthew chapter 5, the well-known Beatitudes, the eight persons or people of whom Jesus said, Blessed. And you know, as a, as a preacher, I meet scores of Christians who are seeking God's blessing. But I meet relatively few who realize that they have to meet certain conditions. And if you meet the conditions, you don't have to seek the blessing. The blessing will seek you. Moses said to Israel, he said, if you fulfill these commandments, the blessing of God will come upon you and overtake you. When I find people simply pursuing blessing, I have grave doubts about their relationship to the Lord. Blessing can become a kind of idol. <coughs> so let me just briefly go through the Beatitudes with you. Somebody in our house put up on the wall, on the mirror, the words, be attitudes. In other words, attitudes of what you be. It's a good way to think about them. They are be attitudes. And we got so used to them, most of us, through going to church, that we don't realize they were extremely controversial. Jesus called people blessed who in the natural and in the world order would be the last people to be considered blessed. He overturned all popular opinion about blessedness. And he came to proclaim the kingdom of the Father. And this really is the charter of the kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount. And what he was saying in effect is, the citizens of the kingdom are people who behave like this. In other words, if we want to be citizens of the kingdom, this is the behavior that is required of us. So let's just read them and not dwell on them too long. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, very few people think it's blessed to be poor. It was a startling statement. Now, he did not speak about, uh, I would say, financial poverty, but he spoke about spiritual poverty. There are two things in which God is said to be rich in the New Testament, rich in mercy and rich in grace. And the poor in spirit are those who realize how much they desperately need the mercy and the grace of God. They are not rich in their own esteem. The, Hebrew, the Greek word used means beggars. Let me ask this, are you spiritually a beggar? Or are you rather satisfied with yourself? And do you feel you've come a long way and you're doing pretty well and you belong to a good church and your church is somewhat better than most of the others? That is not poverty of the spirit. There are two churches in Revelation which are an interesting contrast. They're the last two listed. And I believe each of them is a kind of type of a church at the end of the age. First of all, we'll turn to Revelation 3, verses 15 and following. This is the church of the Laodiceans. Now, loosely interpreted, the word Laodicea means people's rights. The Greek word for people is laos. Diki is a right. So this is the church of the people who are claiming their rights. And Jesus says some of the most amazing things. I've read these words and pondered on them. He says what he said to every one of the seven churches, I know your works. 
I know what you're doing. That you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Jesus said, anything but lukewarm, please. It comes to my mind that good many years ago, I mean probably 25 years ago, I was invited to preach in a church in Canada. Now, I didn't really normally expect such an invitation, but they told me that before I came, they prayed that I would bring them the word of the Lord. And you know what I preached about? The church of Laodicea. And they couldn't believe that was the word of the Lord. Now, I had no prejudice, no preconception. I simply gave them what I believed the Lord had given me. But they were incapable of believing that the description of the church of the Laodiceans could possibly apply to them. Listen to this description. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you or vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. That's faith that's been tested. And white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Could you conceive it possible that people would be wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and not even know it? But that's the condition of the Laodicean church. They had a totally false sense of values because apparently they were financially prosperous. They considered themselves to be spiritual. Does that correspond to anything that we hear taught today? I think it's probably one of the main problems of the American church. Yes. Then we look back to the other end time church, as I understand it, Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love. And to that church, Jesus said, these things, verse 7, says, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. And brothers and sisters, bear in mind that Jesus knows your works. He knows what you're doing. He doesn't merely listen to what you tell him, but he knows what you do. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Really, in a way, their great strength was they had a little strength. They could not rely on their own strength. They had to rely on God's faithfulness. I trust I can say this in the right way. I believe that is true of our ministry. We have a little strength. We're a relatively small ministry. But we have kept God's word. We have not denied his name. And he has set before us a door so amazingly wide that we can hardly believe it. In 1979, I started a radio program in the United States on eight stations with a budget of $8,000 a month and we didn't know where the money would come from. And I had no thought that that radio broadcast would ever go outside the United States. And I didn't do anything to plan it, I didn't do anything to arrange it, but that radio broadcast is now in ten languages, four main Chinese dialects, Russian, Spanish, help me, Arabic, Arabic Mongolian, 
Tongan, and it's, we're working on Indonesian. And I suppose every day it's more than possible that millions of people are exposed to that radio broadcast. That's a great door. But the Lord opened it. We didn't even ask him to open it. We didn't, it didn't occur to us that that would happen. And that's only a part of our ministry. That's the brother here from Burundi. Where is he? He's not here. Gone. Anyhow, he just came up to me and thanked me. He said, we have been receiving your teaching material regularly for years. And we've given it out to hundreds of people. Now on our list of what we call our global outreach program, we have about 1,700 full-time workers in 120 nations who receive free our Bible teaching material. And my books, or part of my books, or some of my literature, has been translated into about 50 languages. Our video Bible school, which consists of 29 hours of teaching by me on video, is now translated into all the main languages of Eastern Europe, except Polish. It's in Russian, Hungarian, Czech, Serbian, Romanian. Romanian, Albanian, and others. What? German. German. Thank you. Now, I don't say that to boast, but if I preach something that didn't apply, why should you listen to my words? What I want to say is, it works. God means what he says. And my main prayer is not that we'll get so many million dollars. It's that we'll be faithful to God's word and not deny his name. After that, God takes care of the consequences. But I believe really that these two churches represent in a way the two main thrusts of what is happening in the spiritual realm in the church today. There are many, many churches like Laodicea. And there are those that are like Philadelphia. And I think we need to ask ourselves, what am I involved in? What am I giving my time and my finance to? Is it some little self-perpetuating group of people who meet weekly on Sunday mornings and when they separate they say God bless you brother see you next Sunday that doesn't interest me and one thing I find difficult is a congregation that consists of people of all of the same color and the same social status I'm really not happy I like a good mixture different colors, different social levels, different languages, that's where I'm happy. In 1963, God thrust me into the Ministry of Deliverance. Some of you have seen some of the things I do. I didn't plan that. But a dear Pentecostal sister who used to play the piano in our Sunday morning services in Seattle, Washington, threw a demonic fit right in front of the platform. And at that moment, I was preaching on this theme. No matter what the devil does, God has the last word. Amen. <laughs> and I saw I had either to prove it or to stop preaching it. And I called my first wife forward, and we, with two other persons, cast the demon out of that woman in front of the congregation. Now, they were Pentecostals. But when the demon went out, they were pale. I mean, they looked as if they'd seen a ghost. They had never seen anything like it in their lives. And without my intending it, I got plunged into this. I didn't seek it. If I'd been given an option, I'd have chosen something much more romantic. <laughs> but something happened. <clears throat> that girl was wonderfully delivered. It took about two hours 
in the pastor's office on Sunday morning. About half the time she was tearing her clothes off which is not the normal procedure for the pastor's office on Sunday morning. <laughs> she never came back to that congregation. And I realized she was ashamed to be seen by those people. And that faced me personally with a challenge. I said, what am I supposed to be pastoring? Is this a middle class social club that meets on Sunday mornings? Or is it a place where those with desperate needs can come and find help? And I made an important decision. I said, for me, I'll go for the people with needs, whether it's respectable, whether they behave nicely in church, whether we have dignified services. All of those are secondary. Let's be real. The theme of this conference is reality. And what I'm telling, to, telling you tonight is reality. Amen. Amen. I thank, you for, I thank God for Brother Mahesh. She's been one of those that has been in the battle with us. And he's been on the battle on his own too. But we, in a way, started together. And we've come a long way. Not because we're great, but because we have a little strength. We've kept God's word and we've not denied his name. So, what kind of congregation do you want to belong to? What kind of activity do you want to be involved in? Let's go back to the Beatitudes very quickly. The next one is, <coughs> Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, nobody considers it normally a blessing to mourn. But Jesus said, that's the ones that get blessed the ones that are sorry, the ones that grieve, the ones that humble themselves, the ones that empathize with the grief of others, they will be comforted. The next one, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is very little spoken of today. In fact, the word is almost dropped out of contemporary usage. But it's still a very real thing. The meek do not appropriate the earth. They do not dominate the earth. They inherit the earth. That's a test of faith. Are you willing to let God allot you your inheritance without grabbing for it, without fighting for it? It's a decision. The next one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Again, especially in the Middle East, that's an absurd statement. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. There were plenty of hungry people and some thirsty people, but they did not consider themselves blessed. It was a paradox. But Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I meet lots of people hungering and thirsting for healing, for deliverance, but I meet comparatively few who are really hungering and thirsting for righteousness. In the church that we attend in Jerusalem, on the Sunday morning service just a couple of months ago, there was a visiting speaker who preached on this test, text, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it was a good sermon, well constructed, good illustrations, and he, was, he went into a great deal of detail about what it really means to be thirsty. And I listened and I thought, that's all right. But I wasn't moved. And then we went into a period of worship. And in the middle of that, the worship leader said, God is here right now. If you have any request, bring it to him. I had premeditated nothing, I didn't have anything in my mind, but without even planning it, I blurted out to the Lord, Lord, all I want is more of you. Yes. And I want to tell you, I got it. I got so much, I was embarrassed. I thought, I'll upset the service. <laughs> Let me recommend that to you. You can't do it out of your own initiative. But if God prompts you, why don't you say that? All I want is more of you. 
Then the next one is, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. One thing has always helped me in my walk with the Lord. I've always seen that I need the Lord's mercy. I have never been a day in my life that I was not aware that I need the mercy of the Lord. So, but I'm not by nature a very merciful person, but I said I have to be merciful because I want God's mercy. I need it desperately. I was impressed by the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 25. We don't need to turn there, but he said, about a certain question, I give my opinion as one who has obtained mercy of the Lord to be found faithful. And it must have been a good 20 years ago, I was struck by the fact that we are not able to be faithful by our own will or by our own efforts. It's only through the mercy of the Lord that we can be faithful. And I continually remind myself of that. Then it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now that's not necessarily so paradoxical. But remember that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And holiness, I think, is purity of heart. It's not keeping a little set of religious rules. It's having a heart that's pure. This past Passover season, in Israel, where they celebrate the Passover, pretty, uh, almost everybody is involved in some way. I was thinking about the fact that the Jewish people had to purge out all old leaven. And I thought to myself, that applies to me. And God brought it to my attention that I had a lot of things in my mind that went back even to the time before I was saved. Phrases that I would use, images that came to my mind, incidents that had taken place, a kind of language that's used by unsaved people, and various kinds of fears and anxiety. And I realized they were all old leaven. And I took a stand to purge them out of my life. Now, I am not free from those pressures, but every time they come, I say, I've purged you out, I am not taking you back. I suggest to you that many of you should consider whether there's old leaven in your thinking, in your attitude, in your reactions. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. A wonderful thing to be a peacemaker. The final beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Do you consider that a blessing? Jesus said, to his disciples, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So when people criticize you, gossip about you, tell lies about you, do you rejoice? And are you exceedingly glad? Because that's the appropriate reaction. So those are just little pictures of what I believe it is to have the nature of the Lamb. It's an incomplete study. But, let me close this particular section with one glorious fact. In this war, it's the Lamb who wins. Hallelujah. That's contrary to all natural expectation. Because all the power, apparently, is on the other side. 
everything in a sense is arrayed against the people who want to live for God. But we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I love the passage in Revelation chapter 5 where John had, he saw the Lamb. I'd like to read the first seven verses of Revelation 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. <coughs> then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? So there was a tremendous demonstration of strength, a strong angel with a loud voice. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and its seven seals. And John turned to look. And I'm sure he expected to see a very powerful, glorious, majestic, awe-inspiring lion. And what did he see? Something quite different. And I looked, and in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he, the lamb, came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. You see, that's absolutely contrary to the way we think naturally. And it's totally contrary to our contemporary culture. Because the most powerful being in heaven was a slain lamb. What is God saying? Let's look at it this way. Jesus gave up his life, died, and was buried. He did not bring himself back to life. The Father raised him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you willing to take the same pathway? To die and stay dead till God raises you back to life. Because when you're raised back to life in that way, it's a different life. That's the overcoming life. That's the life of the kingdom. It's the life of the Lamb. And then all heaven proclaimed the worthiness of the Lamb. And it says in the same chapter, verses 11 and 12, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, which is 10 million, and thousands of thousands, which is millions, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. What's the way to the throne? It's the way of the cross and the tomb and resurrection by the will of God, not by our own efforts. Why are so many Christians struggling in their own strength? Because they've never experienced death. They've never been willing to let go and let God. They've never experienced God's resurrection power in their lives. I'm not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's wonderful, but I'm talking about a level of living where we can say it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I think it would be good for a moment if we were just to say that simple statement, 
as the expression of our heart's gratitude and appreciation. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Again. Worthy is the Lamb. Once more. Worthy is the Lamb. He will be the center of heaven throughout all eternity. And all the mighty angels and the archangels and the seraphim and the cherubim will all bow down and worship that slain Lamb of God. What a lesson. What a picture. I come back to that thought. There are two super spiritual powers at work amongst humanity today. The spirit of the lamb, the spirit of the wild beast. The spirit of the wild beast is a spirit that grabs, dominates, controls, manipulates, and gets everything under its power. It's the spirit that prevails in the political world. It's the spirit that prevails in the business world. Which spirit prevails with you and me? The wild beast or the lamb? And I don't believe there's anything between the two. I don't believe humanity is going to have any other option. Yes. They're going to have precisely the same choice that God gave to Israel. Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? And at that moment, we will have made our choice. If we have been living under the power of the spirit of the wild beast, we will not be able to change. I believe that power is taking humanity over already in the invisible realm. And when the Antichrist is manifested, he will already have his followers. And I'm not speaking to you as different from myself. I am continually concerned in my own mind to be sure that I will not come out on the side of the Antichrist. Amen. Right. This is not a theory. It's for me a very real practical issue. Now, I have one more thing to say and I wasn't sure whether I should say it. I told the people who I had lunch with that if I preach this, unless it's in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it's totally in vain. But I want to talk to you for a moment about revival in a practical sense, revival in Great Britain. In 1953, when I was pastoring a very small congregation in Bayswater, London, one night I woke up about 2 a.m which seems to be the time that God wakes me up. And God spoke to me audibly. That's the only ever time I've heard his voice audible. And I'm not meaning that that's necessarily more authoritative than any other, but it was unique for me. And he didn't make any introduction. He just made certain statements. And the first statement was this. There shall be a great revival in the United States and Great Britain. Now, I was not the least bit interested in the United States in those days. It was before the days of jet travel and we had very little money and as far as we were concerned, the United States was a remote country. Then the Lord spoke to me about my own ministry briefly and I don't ever feel free to say what he said. But he closed with these words. But the condition is obedience in small things and in great things for the small things are as great as the great thing. And I went to the Bible and I studied it and I saw that almost everywhere in the Bible when it speaks about small and great, it always puts small before great. I also have read a certain amount about revival and I observed that one condition that God's people always have to fill, fulfill is obedience. And sometimes it's doing things that seem very silly or unrelated to the issue of revival. And here I am, 
39 years later, I have never forgotten what God said. I have always believed it was God who said it. And I, in a sense, have been waiting to see when it would come to pass. Here I am, 77 years old, and I have the impression I will not be taken by the Lord until I've seen it. That's my personal, subjective opinion. And I am deeply concerned for my own country, Britain. As I said, I think last night, there's no one here more British than I am. I was interviewed by the UCB people last night after the meeting. And they said to me, do you think about, what do you think about Britain? Is there a possibility of revival? And I said, yes, I believe there is. And I used a little example which has become very vivid to me. When I was in South Africa some years back, somebody there told me about an area of South Africa that's called Namakwa land. If there's a South African here, you probably know where it is. They said, this is a very desert area. Very little grows on it. And it can stay that way for five or six or more years. But at rare intervals, it rains heavily in the Namakwa land. And when the rain falls, there's the most gorgeous display of flowers you could see anywhere in the world. The reason is the seeds had lain dormant beneath the soil, but because of the dryness, they didn't germinate. But when the rain fell, all those dormant seeds suddenly burst forth into glorious life. Now, I believe Britain is like the Marquanet. It is dry and barren. But under the surface, there are seeds of biblical truth. This nation, as far as I understand it, over its long history, has had more exposure to the truth of the Bible than any other nation on earth. And the seeds are still there. And once the rain falls, we'll be astonished at what comes out. That's my belief. That's my vision. Now, I want to say we need to distinguish between revival and evangelism. A lot of people talk about revival as if it was evangelism. Now, I believe passionately in evangelism. But when we talk about revival, that's not what we are talking about. Because revival means bringing back to life something that has died. Evangelism is presenting the truth to people who've never had life. Revival it's bringing back to life people who've had life and died. Evangelism affects the unconverted. Revival affects the church. And because the church is the body of Christ and Christ is Lord, ultimately God will not do anything redemptively that he does not do through the body. He will never bypass the body of his son. So it depends on the church. In the great Welsh revival, which is so well known, Evan Roberts used to use this little slogan, bend the church and bow the world. And I believe that's totally true. If the church will bend, the world will bow. But if the church will not bend, God has no other way to reach the world. I believe the destiny of this nation depends on us. We cannot evade our responsibility. Let me suggest two ways in which revival will change the church. Very simple. First of all, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says, God gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church which is his body doesn't say God imposed Jesus on the church. It says God gave Jesus to the church to be head. 
And as I understand, the function of the head is to make the decisions and take the initiative. And I would suggest to you that there is very little in the church today in which Jesus is permitted to make the decisions and take the initiative. The initiative has been taken out of his hand. And it's in the hand of human groups, committees, and others, boards. <laughs> I'm naughty, I mean, I've, I've repented of this, because our ministry has a board. But as a young preacher, I used to be against boards. And I once said, after all, the New Testament does say that there is a use for boards. Because when Paul and his companions were shipwrecked on the island of Malta, they got to shore some on boards and some on pieces of the ship. Well, I've repented of that wrong attitude. But boards are not Jesus Christ. In that little book that I've just made available, The, the Destiny of Israel in the Church, I wrote a sentence which arrested me. I thought, did I write that? And in essence, what I said is this, God only endorses and blesses that which he himself has initiated. And I observed that things which God has initiated, they flourish, they move, they grow, they have life and power. And you understand, it's the height of presumption for us in the church to take the initiative out of the hands of Jesus Christ. But really, there is very little serious attempt to find out what he's planned. Now, there are groups that do it. I, I could name some, but I think I won't because it would be create problems for them, for one thing. But I believe there has to be a revolution if there's going to have a revival in which Jesus truly becomes head over all things to the church. We have, we, Ruth and I are members of a church, so is Mahesh, in Fort Lauderdale, called Good News Church. So when you have GNC, it can stand for Good News Crusade or Good News Church. And about a year and a half ago, I preached on this issue of the headship of Jesus. And it was one of those occasions when I stepped beyond what I planned. And I said to the church, and particularly to the three men in leadership, you have to decide whose head. Are you willing to let Jesus in and really make the decisions and form the plans? And next week in the bulletin, they put, come on in, Lord Jesus. Now, I wouldn't say by any means he's totally ahead, but I believe they are moving in the right direction. The other area which will be affected by revival is the bride, the church's bride. I mean, there are many other areas, but that's the one I want to mention. In Revelation 19, verses 6, 7, and 8, it says, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife or bride has made herself ready. Would you notice that the bride has to have made herself ready? Do we today see a church diligently making herself ready? In most places, there's very little evidence of that. And this is how she made herself ready. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So the material that we will wear for our wedding dress is our righteous acts. There are no righteous acts, no material. I hope I don't sound flippant, but I think the contemporary church has probably just got enough for a bikini.
that's not suitable for a wedding. We have got to produce the righteous acts appropriate to our profession of faith. One righteous act that we've spoken about many times is proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom in all nations. If we don't do that, we cannot expect to have the kind of clothing that's appropriate to the wedding. As I understand it, when you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal savior, his righteousness is imputed to you. That's imputed righteousness. But what it talks about here is outworked righteousness righteous acts. So your righteousness imputed has to be expressed in righteousness outworked. I want to say one more thing about the lamb and clothes. To me this is frightening. I have no intention of deliberately to frighten you, but I think in that way, sometimes we need to be frightened. Years ago, after a deliverance service, a lady came up to me and said, Brother Prince, you scare me. And I said, I think maybe you need to be scared. This personally frightens me. It's the last verses of Revelation chapter 6. It's interesting to me because Ruth and I read Revelation through two or three times and we didn't really get any great understanding. But now I find, without seeking it, I'm just preaching out of Revelation. You see, if you take God's word in, you don't have to do a lot of reasoning. Sooner or later, it'll come out. So I'm going to read Revelation chapter 6. Verses 12 through 17, and this is my closing passage. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. That is a major earthquake. I believe it's going to be the close of the age. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? How many of you have ever seen an angry lamb? I don't believe there ever has been such a thing. It's totally contrary to the nature of a lamb. But in this climax of history, The people who've rejected God's mercy will have a revelation of an open heaven and through it they will look on the most terrible and frightening sight that ever confronted human eyes, the wrath of the Lamb. Because when God's mercy and patience have finally been exhausted. Then there will be a revelation of Jesus such as no one has ever seen, the wrath of the Lamb. And as I understand it, people would gladly be crushed under rocks or mountains rather than have to face this terrible spectacle of the wrath of the Lamb. I don't really have more to say. I know that it's not orthodox to end a message like that. I just want to say one thing which is connected with revival and is not unconnected with what I've been saying. Don Double wrote to me 
before we came to this camp and he said, I've been praying about next year's camp in Malvern and he said, the only word I get is invite Derek Prince. And normally I don't make hasty commitments, but when I got that letter I felt I have to say yes. And I've said yes. God willing, Ruth and I will be here again this time next year. And I somehow have an impression that it's got something to do with revival in Britain. You see, it'll be precisely 40 years from 1953 when the Lord spoke to me. And I have a sense of anticipation, a sense of excitement. But let's remember that revival doesn't come till we meet God's conditions. God is sovereign, but his sovereignty expresses itself in causing us to meet his conditions. A lot of people are prophesying revival. I'm not sure that that helps because people may have the attitude, well, revival is coming, we don't need to do much about it. I don't see it that way. I believe that revival will come when God's people meet his conditions. And I'd like to suggest to you, those of you who are involved with Good News Crusade and come to these camps, that we really take time to seek God and find out what is his plan for 1993. I have a feeling it's going to be different. I had the impression this year I must teach on the end times because if God's people are ignorant of that, they cannot respond intelligently to God's program. But next year, I don't know what I'll be teaching, but I believe in some way it will deal with what we have to do and to be if we really want revival. And if you're going to be here and we're going to be here, I ask you to prepare your hearts to keep this matter before God in prayer. Because nothing else can save this nation from disaster but a sovereign a revival of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. A revival that will bring back holiness and righteousness and the fear of the law and fruitfulness. As I've said, I believe in evangelism. But the end purpose of evangelism is to bring sinners into the church. And what kind of church are we going to bring them into? I don't want to dwell on this, but in 1954, the first time Billy Graham came to Haringey, I served as a counselor in that crusade. And I counseled 22 people, and I kept a record of each one, and we were required to follow them up, to phone, to write, to do everything. And I did it as well as I could do, but at the end of it all, I was forced to the conclusion that probably there were only two people out of the 22 who had remained really committed Christians. And it so happened they both joined my congregation. I didn't ask them, I didn't want them, but I don't believe they would have survived if they hadn't been brought under the teaching of the Word of God. And so you see, we can be as energetic and active as we please in revival, but what are we going to bring the sinners into? At that time in London, some rather cynical Christians said, it doesn't make sense to put a live chick under a dead hen. The first thing we need to do is get the hen alive. Then the chick will survive. Is that true? Amen. Now, dear brothers and sisters, it could be that some of you are really Laodiceans. You're poor and blind and miserable and naked and you don't know it. 
you're not really committed to the Lord Jesus. You're not following the Lamb. You're not called, chosen, and faithful. And if you were to go out of this camp in that condition, your future could be very dangerous. So I want to do one last thing, which is invite those of you who are not really followers of the Lamb. You may be church members, but there's no real serious commitment to the Lordship of Jesus in your lives. And this is the last chance you have in this camp. And I want to ask you to pray right where you sit. Face the truth. As the Bible says, consider your ways. And then if you feel that you would be unhappy to leave this camp in your present spiritual condition, you don't want to go out into the dark not knowing where you'll end up, I would invite you to make a decision tonight, a serious decision to commit yourself without reservation to the Lord Jesus Christ and do whatever he leads you to do. I'm going to ask Jonathan, which I did beforehand, to lead us in the singing of the song. What is it? Worthy is the Lamb, Jonathan, are you there? Now, as, as Jonathan is leading the singing, and we are singing, if you want to make that kind of commitment that I've spoken about, you may get up from where you are, walk out, and come to the front. And we will pray with you, and there are people here who will minister to you. So you don't need to leave here half committed, unsure. All right, have you heard what I say? I'm not going to renew this appeal. This is the last time I'll say it. But if you are really concerned about the well-being of your own soul and the future of your life, you'll never have a better opportunity than you have here tonight to settle it. I just want to say that the Holy Spirit shows me that there are at least two men here tonight who are halting between two opinions. And this may be your last chance to come on the side of the Lord Jesus. 